and Pee Wee walked right, right past me. She goes, oh, I didn't even recognize you. <laughs> uh, I know it's late in the game, but I have decided to run for the President of the United States. I appreciate you so much. You guys are very, very kind. Uh, this is the only suit I have. Uh, no, I'm not doing a funeral later on today. Uh, no, nobody's getting married today. I just thought it would be fun to look, man, I can't breathe in this thing. <laughs> Official for this message. Uh, today's message is a standalone message. And the reason that I wanted to give this message today is because this Tuesday, November 3rd, our country will elect a president for the next four years. And even though we may not know who the president will be until Christmas, I, uh, I want to go on record today as your pastor in saying this, read my lips, right? And I'm not going to say no new taxes. I'm going to say this, whomever is elected as our president, as a follower of Jesus Christ, am I not working? I've got a big voice. I didn't even re recognize that. Oh, can you hear me? I'm not going to start again. Okay. Whomever is elected, thank you, as our president, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I will respect and honor them as someone who lives and does his best to live by a biblical worldview, I will respect and honor our next president, whether they are a Democrat or a Republican. Here's why. Peter writes these words to us. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Church, this verse talks about four major areas in our life as believers, and Peter gives us four specific responses or reactions. We may want to call them attitudes or even manners. We don't use that word very often anymore, do we? That we should have or we should develop as followers of Jesus Christ toward these four different segments of our society. And the reason why I want to talk to you about this verse today and about having a biblical worldview in these four areas is because regardless of what happens in this presidential election, I want us as believers in Jesus Christ to rise above the norm of what is going on in our world today because our world is not living out this verse at all. So that means that you and I have a great opportunity to show the world how followers of Jesus Christ respond even when things don't go the way that we would like them to go. So Peter says to us first, show proper respect to everyone. So what is the biblical definition of respect? Am I still not working? Oh yeah, it's orange. You didn't miss any of that, though, did you? No. Yeah. See, I was taught uh, uh, from stage that you project, you throw your voice, so. Thank you, Ray. I heard what he said. He said, you're doing well, Pastor. <laughs> okay, let's. I don't think Satan wants you to hear this message. Right. Okay, are we on? Yes. Okay. So, Peter says to us first, show proper respect to everyone. So what is the biblical definition of respect? Respect means to place great value on something. So as we talk about respect this morning, this is how we are defining respect. To place great value on something. So here is our first question. What does the Bible say about respect? Here is the answer. Everyone deserves proper respect. 
Everyone deserves to be valued. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that God places a great value on you? Of course he does. He places great value on us. The song we just heard, he knows us by name. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He knows the hairs on our head or the lack of hair on our head. <laughs> and God created man in his own image. Turn to the person next to you and say, God created you in his image. Crosspoint, this is a biblical worldview. As believers, we must be conscious of the fact that God created all people in his image. Red, yellow, black, brown, and white. They are all precious in his sight. And God created all people in his image, whether they believe in him or not. And God created all people in his image, whether they think the way that we think or not. And are you ready for this one? Here's one for you. God created all politicians in his image, <laughs> even if their ideology is the exact opposite of yours. You see, to respect everyone demands that we see in them the reflection of our creator. Respect demands that we see in all people the reflection of our creator. And sometimes it takes work to see it, but if we ask God to help us, we will see his reflection in all of creation. Within this definition of respect, a biblical worldview then demands that we see all people created in the image of God. Let's unwrap this a little deeper. To respect everyone demands that we see that their souls are of greater value than all the wealth of the world. Jesus teaches us that one soul is more valuable than the whole world. So if your soul is more valuable than all the wealth of the world, doesn't it just make sense then that I should respect you? Jesus talked about this a lot while he was here on earth. In Jesus' time, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other with a passion, okay? And we've got some of that going on in the world today, don't we? In fact, the Jews refer to the Samaritans as half-breeds and dogs. So Jesus, in a very culturally relevant way, used the Jews and Samaritans in one of his parables as an example of placing great value or respect on someone. He says, this is a parable Jesus tells. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed him by on the other side. Then... A despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill run, runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits, Jesus asked? The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Yes, now go and do the same. Church, every human being that we come in contact with is someone who is made in the image of God. So therefore, they are deserving of respect. Every human being we come in contact with is someone whose soul is worth more than all the wealth of the world, which means that they have great value and they are deserving of respect. And this is why Peter says to us, show proper respect to everyone. My friends, this is a biblical worldview. 
As followers of Jesus Christ, in case you don't know what a worldview is, as followers of Jesus Christ, this book must shape our philosophy of life. This book must shape our conception of the world. This book must shape how we see the world and how we respond to the peoples in this world. Next, Peter says, love the brotherhood of believers. The word love here is the well-known Greek word agape. So our definition for love is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love. Interestingly here, the, the word love is in its verb form, which means it is continuous. So Peter is saying to us, keep on keeping on loving the brothers and sisters in Christ. So what does the Bible say about loving other Christians? Now, this is a very blanket statement that Peter is making because he's not saying you really need to like other believers and he's not saying you really need to be emotionally connected with other believers. No, he is describing an action. Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So as followers of Jesus Christ, our response to loving the brotherhood is simply this. As an act of our will. You see, it's a choice that we make to give love to every other Christian. Now, Crosspoint, this is something that we need to work on. Loving the brotherhood of believers means to love all believers, period. If we allow nationality or race or opinion or politics or denominations to divide us, then we are not loving the brotherhood of believers. The greatest demonstration of Christianity is when all God's people, when every brother and sister in Christ makes the choice to love. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what does God's word say about loving all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, those we know and those we do not know? I want to give you 10 biblical ways very quickly of how we can love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can look these up later on today or this week. Number one, it means we put them first. Number two, we seek their good. Number three, we ask for forgiveness and we forgive them because we all need forgiveness, don't we? Number four, we listen to them. Number five, we include them. Number six, we are generous toward them. Number seven, we sacrifice for them. Number eight, we tell the truth. Number nine, we encourage one another with the message of the gospel. And number 10, we pray for each other. And the prayer group all said, amen, right? Church, this is how we love the brotherhood. And this is a biblical worldview. It's not about an emotion. It is about instead an act of our will. That's important to understand. Because we don't have to feel ooey gooey. What we do need to do is make a choice by an act of our will to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> the third area of our life that Peter speaks to is our attitude toward God. He simply says, fear God. Now, if you grew up the way I grew up, this verse probably scared you to death. It caused me to run to the altar every Sunday when the service was over because during the week I inevitably would tell my brother that I, you know, I hate you or I would slug him or something and I would think God is going to shoot me off to hell in a handbasket. So let me give you a picture 
of how this verse has been misinterpreted. Let's watch this short little movie clip. Almighty God, we thank thee for thy bounty. Grant unto us the grace ever to live in dread of thee. And bless this food unto our nourishment that it may strengthen us to do thy will in all things. Amen. Would you bring another glass of milk, please? Yes, ma'am. Almighty God. I don't know if you heard her prayer, but it went like this. Almighty God. Then she said a few other things. And she said, help us to ever live in fear and dread of thee. Don't you just love that prayer? No wonder Pollyanna <laughs> spilled her glass of milk, right? <laughs> Doesn't that make you just want to love Jesus? <laughs> the Greek word for fear here is phobeo, and it means to be in awe of, to revere, to fear in reverence. So what does the Bible say about fearing God? Let me give you three verses that help us to interpret what it means to fear God. Solomon said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, when we are in awe of God, when we have an odd respect for him and for him alone, this attitude brings wisdom that produces a skill in living. David unwraps this idea some more. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. In other words, before trouble came into my life, I was on the top of the world doing my own thing, calling my own shots, but then disappointment and pain came into my life and it brought me to my senses and it brought me to a place of repentance and now I fear and I respect God and I obey his word. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. If you're going through a time of pain right now, God wants your attention. I think this is what David was saying. He was saying, my affliction led me back to the Lord. I used to live for myself, but now, through my pain, now I obey God's word. And then Jesus puts the icing on the cake. He says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So when we take all of these scriptures into consideration, we understand that Peter is saying to us, when it comes to God, our attitude and our response to him is in a category all unto itself. So here is the answer to this question of why we should fear God. We should fear God and have an odd respect for him. Why? Because that is what leads us to total obedience. You see, when we fear God, we obey God. Followers of Jesus Christ obey him. Church, this is a biblical worldview. And this is how followers of Jesus Christ are called to live. The last area that Paul addresses is the one that is the most difficult for many of us here today. Paul says, honor the king. In other words, honor your governing authorities. So I'm just about ready to wrap up. So I want everybody to take a deep breath, okay? Just take a deep breath because I'm just telling you, I need to repent and probably most of us here need to repent in this area. Okay. The Greek word for honor is tomato, not to be confused with tomato. It's tomato. Okay. And it comes from, watch this. You guys aren't going to believe this. It comes from a word that means to prize 
to revere, to honor, and to value. So if we stop and think for this, think about this for a moment, honor is a bigger deal than respect. And when the Bible was written, the posture of honor looked kind of like this. That's what honor looked like back in Bible days. Do you remember the story of Queen Esther in the Bible? Going to the king was a really big deal because if the king decided not to extend his scepter to you, you could actually have your head cut off. Now, we understand that that is taking it way too far, but I submit to you this morning that as believers, we have gone way too far the other way. I believe that as Christians, we are guilty of ignoring God's word when it comes to honoring those that are in authority over us. And I submit to you, and as I have prepared this week, I have asked God to forgive me. I believe that we should repent and embrace a biblical worldview when it comes to honoring our governing authorities. And I understand they make it very tough to do so. But what does the Bible say about honoring our authority? Here's what it says. And we discussed this in our men's Bible study this past Wednesday night. If you're looking for a good Bible study, men, I invite you 7 p.m. Mark Crawford's been teaching. He's doing an excellent job. But we talked about this. So do you know what the Bible says about honor? I'm going to tell you, okay? This is not hard. This is not my opinion. This is what the Bible says. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. We don't like that, do we? For all authority comes from God. Oh, my goodness. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by who? Oh, my. So anyone who rebels against authority is actually rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right and they will honor you. Now, let's do a very important sidebar right here. We all understand that this is a general statement. But we also understand that there are exceptions to the rule here, because we do understand that in some cases, people have done the right thing, but they have still been punished either for their beliefs or because of the color of their skin. So we understand that. The point I'm trying to make is for believers in Jesus Christ, honoring those in authority over us is what we have been called to do. It's what we are to aim for whenever possible. That's why Paul says to us, live at peace with all men as much as you are able to, right? So we have to understand that sidebar. Verse 4. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to, to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Let's just be honest. We understand this. Okay. Because when I'm driving down the road, I like to get where I'm going. I don't dilly and dally around. The speed limit says 75. I think it's a suggestion. And sometimes I look down and I'm going 90. 
And then you know what? I pass a policeman. And you know what happens to me? The same thing that happens to you. Automatically, I feel guilty. Why? Because I'm breaking the law, right? Okay, so we kind of under, understand what he's saying here. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. That is Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, if you'd like to do a little study here. I ran across a great article by a guy named Craig Rochelle. I want to share it with you. He writes, last year, I was invited to speak at a leadership event that was to span several days. I spoke on Thursday. Then on Friday, former President George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, were scheduled to speak. That Friday afternoon, as we were waiting for the president and the first lady to arrive, I was visiting casually with the gentleman seated next to me. I learned that he was not a fan of President Bush at all. He told me I didn't vote for him. I never liked him. I didn't agree with his policies, but that was just the warm up. This guy went on and on, specifying the things he didn't approve of and why. Suddenly, a door opened and a soldier walked in carrying the flag of the United States of America. Hail to the chief began to play and everyone in the room rose to their feet, cheering and clapping. The president walked in holding the first lady's hand. I glanced sideways at this man standing next to me, the man who couldn't stand the guy, and tears were streaming down his face. He was clapping and smi smiling broadly. In that moment, my neighbor was no longer a Democrat or a Republican. He wasn't a fan of President Clinton or of President Obama, and he wasn't a critic of President Bush. He was simply a citizen of the United States, freely offering honor. If not to the man, then at least to the office. The feeling in the room was electric. Why? Because everyone there showed honor. Church, I submit to you this morning that this kind of bipartisan honor is what we, as believers in Jesus Christ, are called to emulate. And it makes no difference who becomes our next president. Our responsibility and our job as believers in Jesus Christ is to honor our governing authorities. We do not have to like them and we don't have to agree with their policies. But if we are going to live out a biblical worldview, we must honor our next president, period. Now, I know some of you are thinking right now, well, why, Harv? Why? Why, why? why do we have to do that? Why are we supposed to do that? Well, here's why. And my answer comes straight from the word of God. We honor our governing authorities because they exist by the very will of God. Did you hear me? We honor our governing authorities because they exist by the very will of God. Of God and our decision to honor them church has nothing to do with whether or not we agree with them according to God's word those that are in authority are God's chosen instruments to carry out the purpose of governing here's another layer of why we should honor them cross point when we honor our governing authorities, we give genuine credibility to our faith. And when we honor them, we are honoring the Lord Jesus Christ himself because he is the ultimate authority and nothing happens outside of his sovereignty, according to his word. Amen. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be people of order, 
discipline, righteousness, and justice. We are to be examples of love and peace so the lost may be one to Christ. Jesus said to us, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your what? Good deeds and praise your father in heaven. We used to sing this song in Sunday school. Would you join me in singing it? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Do you know how we let our lights shine today? Here's how. By showing proper respect to everyone, by loving the brotherhood of believers, by fearing God and obeying him, and by honoring those in authority over us. Cross point, this is a biblical worldview, and this is what we are called to as believers in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence that we have felt in this place this morning. We thank you for the freedom to come and gather and worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you that you have spoken to us this morning through your word. Father, I want to stand in front of this church that you have allowed me to pastor and ask you to forgive me for not showing the proper honor that I should show to those who are governing and who are my authority. Please forgive me. Father, I pray that you would help us as a church to show proper respect to everyone. Why? Because every individual is created in your image. Help us to love the brotherhood of believers. Why? Because they will know we are Christians by our love. Help us to fear God. Why? Because when we fear God and have a healthy respect for him, we obey him. And help us to honor those in authority over us. Why? Because that is when we shine the brightest and the best. Father, would you help us as we come into an uncertain time in our country? Help us as believers in Jesus Christ, regardless of what happens, to be a city that is set on a hill and a light that cannot be hidden. Help our light to shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Father, I thank you for this group of people. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the truth of your word. We love you. We praise you. We pray that you would apply the truth of your word to our life. May we have a biblical worldview and live by it. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday.